Hello and uh, welcome to CMC Markets and the first non-farm payrolls webinar of 2017. Happy New Year to all of you. Um, hopefully this year will be as volatile and as hopefully profitable for all of you as maybe 2016 was. Certainly I think in terms of market volatility I certainly think that uh, 2017 has the potential to be as equally as choppy but hopefully as equally as profitable. Anyway this um, this webinar will be hosted by myself Michael Hewson and my colleague in Toronto Colin Szynski. Good morning and, um, everyone, Happy New Year. Indeed, Happy New Year to you too mate because I think this is the first time we've spoken on the phone as well. So It is. Um, hopefully we can shed a little bit of light on today's non-farm payrolls numbers and I certainly think expectations are a little bit lower in terms of the impact they're likely to have on the overall market. Um, I think what we've seen thus far is that equity markets have got off to a fairly solid start. Um, the big question I think that I have and I'm not sure whether you share this Colin is whether or not the gains we've seen in the first tr few trading days of 2017 will be built upon or whether as you suggested that maybe we're seeing a little bit of a fake out higher before a correction lower. I think certainly what we have seen thus far is a little bit of weakness in the dollar despite the fact that we made new 14 year highs earlier this week and maybe there's potential that maybe we could be seeing a little bit of a pullback or could be due a little bit of a pullback as we head into these numbers and I think these numbers could actually play an important role in determining whether or not we get that US dollar pullback because since Trump and now well, since Trump won in on November the 9th equity markets have been pretty much one way and I think potentially everyone's looking at the positives and they're not really paying that much attention to the negatives absolutely and, uh, and we're seeing that in the U.S. dollar as well, Michael. I mean, it just absolutely steamrolled everything in sight. Uh, you know, it crushed the euro and the pound and gold and Canadian dollar and you name it. It's everything's just been flattened by the U.S. dollar rally. And yesterday was the first day since since about the, the last couple of weeks we'd seen the U.S. dollar kind of showing signs of peaking. And yesterday was the first day we started to see it really start to give way. Uh, the dollar starting to break down and everything else kind of starting to break out of some of these bases. Uh, overnight trading has been fairly quiet and we've just seen things digesting but the breakout points uh, have been holding. So I think really uh, as much as we might see action in the equity markets on uh, on today's payroll numbers, really I think the big, the big focus is really going to be on currency markets where we're going to confirm or reject the moves we had uh, in the US dollar yesterday. Yeah, and I think actually dolly yen is probably a good bellwether for that, Colin. I don't know Absolutely. whether you agree with me, but I'm, I've been looking mm -hmm. on the chart forums. I posted this this morning on the chart forums. Is this, this potential? There's a potential double top formation forming on the, on the dolly yen here. Um, we've got these two peaks here around about 118.65 and we've got the bottom here which is around about 116.20 now we have broken below that already but I'm actually looking probably more at these sorts of at these sorts of levels here for a potential breakout lower 115.60 I think that point is there um, and I think if we get a disappointment well actually that's a little bit lower it's 114.80 but certainly in the context of this this dashed line here if if we take this chart all the way out, we can see that this 115.80 level was the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of the entire down move from the 2015 highs, which initially acted as resistance. We've broken above it. We've posted a double resistance, a double tap at 118.65, and thus far we've managed to hold above it around about 115, around about 115.60, 70. You know, and I think that for me would suggest that if we do get a push lower in the same way that we've had a bit of a push lower on the Chinese yuan as well, then potentially we could see a little bit of dollar weakness. I don't know what your take on that is, but certainly I think there is some evidence that if we get a poor payrolls number, maybe that could be the catalyst to push this lower. 
Yeah, that's what I'm thinking as well, Michael. I think that the, uh, I think the what we saw in in the stock market, particularly with the Dow, once it got above 19, it just got drawn up towards 20,000. I think it got way ahead of itself. Here on the U.S. dollar, uh, I think with where the dollar index has gotten itself to, is pricing in four or five rate hikes for this year. Uh, I'm much more dovish than that. I'm thinking two. Mm -hmm. I, I believe uh, you're you're thinking that or even one. Mm -hmm. And um, and even yesterday, Williams from the Fed was out talking three. So regardless. Regardless, the, um, the market has gotten ahead of at a minimum ahead of the party line and probably ahead of reality. I think they've priced in Trump for perfection. I think they've figured that everything Trump's going to get to do whatever he wants. There's going to be no ramifications, and it's all going to be positive and glorious. And that's not the case. I mean, the, the data can be bumpy. The, the process can be bumpy. Even if he does get what he wants, it's going to probably take a year before things actually start getting implemented and hit the economy. Uh, this is Yellen's last year. And she's probably not going to be in a rush to cooperate. Uh, very much either, and, and so there's a lot, and headwinds. I mean, where there was talk, you know, of, uh, you know, if Trump starts bringing in stuff against China, how does China retaliate, or do they? I mean, he's been able to get his way with Mexico so far, but well, yeah. Uh, what about Toyota though, country. Colin? Sorry. What, what about Toyota? Um, they've already yeah, exactly. ja the Japanese Toyota have already too, I mean, pushed back against of, him. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of potential for pushback, right? Mm. He's um, so I think that, and, and I, don't, I think the pushback is just getting started. So the market, I think, is thinking everything's going to go one way, and there's all kinds of ways that that can go wrong and the wheels can fall off. So at this point, the balance of uh, the balance of risks on the U.S. dollar is, is definitely to the downside from where it's gotten. And even if you did see hawkish news, how much more hawkish can the market get? Yeah, and I think that's the big question. I think if we, if we cast our mind back to 12 months ago, the market was pricing in four rate rises. And that was always an unrealistic proposition in a deflationary environment, which we had a year ago. This year is more inflationary, so you would expect that the four rate hike scenario would be more plausible. Yet, even though bond markets are reflecting higher rates, there has been, I think, some indications that we're seeing a little bit of a pushback even on that. Yes, we've seen higher yields, and there is a significant cap on the 20,000 level on the Dow. If we were going to hit it, I would have thought we would have hit it by now. I think the fact that we haven't means there's, there could be a potential for a lot of tired long positions out there. And I don't think it would take that much to suggest that potentially we could get a bit of a sell-off in the event of a disappointing number. Furthermore, what we've seen here in bond markets in the 10-year note is that this is obviously the, the big sell-off that we've seen since those peaks in July. Um, so the big sell-off in prices, the big spike in yields. Since the middle of December, in the wake of the Fed rate rise, we've seen prices rebound and yields come off. But I think there is potential for yields to come even lower if we get back above this line here that I've drawn on this 10 year chart here. And this is the pullback line. This is the pullback line from the uptrend that we broke um, earlier in 2016 or in late 2016 when we broke below this uptrend line from the 2013 lows. I think yields are probably going to find it a little bit difficult to get much below 2.2% on the 10 year. And that would suggest that potentially we could see a move back to 2.6%. Certainly, I think there's potential for high yields. I just don't think that we're probably there yet. We've seen a bit of dollar weakness, and I think that's borne out in the dollar index, and it's also in the rebound in the dollar index, and I think it's quite notable that the rebound, the sell-off in the dollar index that we've seen has come about as a direct result of the rebound in treasury prices as well. Um, so, yes. Can you know, I mention something, Michael? You can. I just wanted to add something in on stocks. If you look, uh, the other thing that we've got now—it's not for today, but it's for probably about a week and a half. Next week on potential profit warnings, and the week after when numbers start rolling out, mm. keep an eye out on earnings and guidance. The higher U.S. dollar could hit U.S. corporate guidance, mm. and also watch out because yesterday Macy's put out a profit warning. Their stock took a 14% hit. It wouldn't take much in the way of bad news to send, or, or disappointment to send the markets hurtling lower when you see a big company like that take that kind of haircut on a profit. Profit warning. Sure, but I mean, I think that's, in, that's retailers in general. I think Coles also yeah, reported absolutely. a bit of a profit warning as well. What I'm particularly yes, uh, looking at next week is not so much yeah. retailers. I think we pretty much acknowledge the fact that retailers have had a tough time. It's banks. Yes, that too. The, the, 
this, the, slope, this, the sloping up in the yield curve has certainly helped bank profitability, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've come up the way that we have over the course of the past few weeks. Banks have started to become more profitable. In fact, if you look at the FTSE 350 bank index, bank shares have been in an uptrend since the middle of last year, and I think that, li that is likely to continue if the reflation trade, and this is really what the, the recent rally in the past few weeks has been all about. It's been about the reflation trade, but also what we've seen this week is an improvement in some of the economic data, not only um, in the US, but also in China, in Japan, and here in the UK. And the big question I think is, when does that higher inflation start to choke off the recovery in that economic data. What's the tipping point between the two? We've seen the spike in yields, we've seen a little bit of coming off now over the course of the past few days and weeks in terms of yields. The big question now I think really is you know where do yields go from here and I'm certainly looking at this this Bloomberg chart which I've got up in front of you. It's the 10-year chart, the 10-year yield chart you know, is there a topping formation coming in here? You know, th there's a big, big level around about two th 225, I think, on U.S. Treasuries. So I will be keeping an eye on that, and obviously looking at the uh, looking at the price chart as well, and inverse to that. What I also found quite interesting about this particular chart is how closely it mirrors iron ore. That's interesting. So iron ore looks a little bit soft, and, and I think a large part of the reason we've seen the commodity rebound is because of the rebound in iron ore prices and the increase in consumption from countries like China and Japan. If these two charts start to roll over, they could, you know, they, they, they could definitely pull the rest of the market lower with them. I, I was only A couple uh, things, Michael. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to mention. Uh, personally, I think, and I'm, I suspect you'd agree with me that I think the the central banks are going to let inflation run, particularly after all the years of deflation. I don't think they're going to be in a hurry to go capping the off that or capping off the recovery. Uh, I'm also not until the numbers come out. Perhaps we could just do our uh, our forecast. So I'll go quick for Canada. Yeah, go on, go ahead. I'm at uh, 10,000. The streets are negative two. I still think the streets overly pessimistic on Canada jobs. For the U.S., I'm at uh, 160 with a 20k upward revision. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself yesterday on ADP payrolls and called 225 and got my head handed to me. So I've reined myself back in. I do think that we did. I still think we got a, a bit of a uh, release of uh, pent up hiring demand in November. I think we'll get a 20k upward revision, but that seems to have petered out pretty quickly in December. Go, Michael. I'm going 165 on non-farm payrolls. I think, despite the fact that we saw some very decent headline ISM numbers this week, what I was struck by was the weak employment components of them. The ADP in particular yesterday, even though it showed it a big rise in services jobs of 169,000, um, there was actually a decline of 16,000 in manufacturing jobs, and they tend to be the more higher wage jobs. Uh, and, and that, for me, I think really sort of feeds into the average earnings narrative, this, this number here. And I think this is the number that could actually drive where the dollar goes. In December, in the November numbers, it actually posted a negative number of minus 0.1. Now, we are expecting a rebound on that back to 0.3, but it's the annual number that I'm particularly interested in. That's expected to rise from 2.6 to 2.8. If that is any way weak, and the headline number on the non-farm payrolls is anywhere around 150, then I certainly think there's potential for a little bit of a sell-off in the dollar. And I think you'll probably see that better, best illustrated in dollar-yen. Dollar-yen tends to be a fairly decent arbiter of direction in terms of dollar strength and weakness. At the moment, we're getting a little bit of light buying into the numbers. Now, m maybe that's an indicator, maybe it isn't. But let's not forget the key. I think the key level for me is this series of lows through here around about 115.60 on, on, the, on the downside. That will tell me whether or not that, that will tell me whether or not the market has the legs to push the dollar lower. On the top side, again, we've got resistance around 116.50. Let's tuck that to one side. On the euro dollar, I'm particularly interested in around about the 106.20 area, around about here, these peaks here. So again, a weak dollar number could push us through this series of highs through here. Keep an eye on that. Otherwise, a strong number could push euro dollar lower. I think there's potential for dollar, euro dollar and cable to squeeze higher on the back of a potentially weak dollar number. I think the, the long dollar position, we've outlined it before, it's a crowded trade. 
and for me I think it wouldn't take much for us to see a little bit of a dollar sell-off into the end of the week and that in turn could actually cap the recent rally that we've seen this week in equity markets. If we look at the UK, the FTSE 100, we saw a very, very big rise in the first day of this week, similar sort of rise in the DAX, but that struggled to be maintained over the past three days, which suggests to me that further upside is probably fairly low conviction, and it wouldn't take much to actually see a significant amount of profit taking start to take place as we head into the numbers. Is there anything else you want to sort of add to that in the last 30 seconds before we Yeah, we just we had break? a quick question here on the Dow. Yeah. Uh, I think what happened at the end of the year was there was a lot of pent-up demand for stocks that got, uh, that got pulled in, and, and the, uh, before the end of the year, a lot of fund managers wanting to uh, not get caught with so much cash when the market was up, uh, a lot of uh, inflows of uh, individuals pouring money into uh, equity funds. That, I think, now that the year is over, is dried up, and that's the, and that's the, uh, the demand for stocks come up and I think there's a certain number of people would be looking for any excuse to take some profits here. Okay, numbers are out. Okay. 156. 156 non-farms, weak number. 4.7 unemployment. K upward revision, 26K. We got 7, yeah, 17K. So pretty K much upward. what we were looking at. And well, November trade deficits widened out as well. Yeah. So Canada employment, 53,000, that's huge. That's 81,000 increase in, in full-time employment is absolutely massive. But average earnings, look at average earnings, Colin, on, on the dollar. Yep. That's higher than expected. So that's why we're seeing the spike higher in the dollar. 0.4 yep. average earnings, that's 2.9% annualized. So going to keep an eye on 116.40.45 on dollar yen to see whether yep. or not we crack through that. Because I think that's, you know, obviously from a dollar point of view, that's a fairly positive number. The big question is, do we have the legs to take it higher? Certainly the market wants to try and go higher. And I think we could actually have a little bit of a crack higher. I'm not sure, though, that we have the potential to do it. And certainly it does appear to suggest that we don't have the legs to go higher. And if they can't do it on this, on that kind of news, then they probably won't be able to. Yeah. I mean, I would, I, would certainly, I would certainly argue that that's a decent average earnings number, but it's only one yeah. number. It's that's right. One number. So if we can't push through on this, then the, then the, 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 uh, then the risk is clearly to the downside. So I think, I think probably what we're going like to... it's peak yeah, to me. Yeah, what I think we're probably going to do is we're going to try and we're going to try and go higher. If we can't get through 116.5 on dollar yen, then the potential is we'll probably um, trade between... Uh, the lows that we saw earlier today uh, and the peaks that we've seen thus far on, on this move higher. There's also a dollar CAD chart that I'd like to show you. Yeah, because can you put that up? That's a huge spike there. Because I think um, there's certainly potential here for dollar CAD. I did a chart earlier on this chart here. Can you see this? Yeah, bring up the, put up the one minute chart. I've got the, uh, the minute chart. It's just exploding. Right, there's a big, big chart point on the, here uh, Canada jobs on, 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 on Canada. Huge. This, this, this trend line. Okay, well, I'll do the one-minute chart, but yeah. then let's take let's t let's oh, take sure. let's there take it out a little <laughs> bit further, because I think here, look at this trend line from the 2014 lows mm -hmm. that I've drawn in, and now we're going to take it down to dailies, and look where the 200-day moving average is. So this line here. Um, it's probably going to limit the downside on dollar CAD, I think. I, pus I posted it on the chart forums earlier today. The trend line support currently comes in at 131.20, so that's about 95 points below where we are now. Um, so I think you could also use this line as a proxy for further oil price strength. Now, a break lower could further signal ca further Canada gains and oil price strength, but ultimately the trend that we've been in since 2014 lows, I think we could well see a test of this line. Yes, it's definitely possible. You know, and whether you it's might even test that 200 week average. Yeah, and I think it's yeah, exactly, and I think it, it, it's, it's going to want to it's going to want to test that line. The yeah, question is, so how too. do we do that? Especially since that's a previous low as well, so yeah. that's in around what 131 there. It's 131.20. Yeah. Uh, and the 200-day moving average is slightly below that. It's at around 130.98. So between 131 and 131.20, obviously that is an upsloping trend line. So this time next week it's going to be slightly higher. 
with 131.25, 131.30 as we head into next week. But certainly I think that's a line, ladies and gentlemen, that's worth keeping an eye on because I think the initial test lower could provoke a bit of a bounce. So if you're short dollar CAD, that's probably going to be a decent area to probably take profit or potentially put a long position in. Perhaps we could take a look at the Dow now, Michael? Yeah, we can indeed. Let's have I'm a look. I'm seeing some questions coming up here about the Dow, so let's take a look at that. Right, this is the daily chart that we're currently looking at at the moment. And I have to say, it doesn't really inspire me too much, this particular chart, because it's not really been doing anything all week. So let's look at the hourly chart. So it's not doing too much off of the news because it's Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the, the hourly chart. So let's go and look at, let's look at five minutes. I mean, obviously, that's a, it's a decent number. It's positive for the Dow. Certainly, I think we'll have another crack higher towards this series of highs that we saw late last night, potentially around about 19,940, 19,950. But f for me, I think if we're going to break the 20,000 level, we need to do it soon because we've had... Oh, yeah, absolutely. The longer we wait, the more likely we're not going to. Yeah, exactly, because how, you know, how patient can you be? Donald Trump's inauguration is in 14 days' time, so the big question is, can the current rally that we've seen since November the 8th carry on into the inauguration of the new president? Because ultimately, president-elect is one thing. He hasn't got his hands on the levers of power yet. On the 20th of January, he will. And what will he do? And that's when people start uh, reacting what he actually does or doesn't do rather than speculating on, on what he might do. Exactly. Uh, you know, and I think that for me, I think, is the key, the key thing here. Looking at the Dow, I'm looking at the S&P as well, though they do tend to move rather independently of each other. But again, I think there's probably a better chance that we're going to test the bottom end of this range than break through the top end even though we are much closer to the top yeah. end on the S&P than we are on the Dow. Yeah, I'm thinking we might see 19,000 on the Dow before we see 20,000, even though we're at 19, eight, even despite from where we are. Well, that's my prediction as well. I actually updated that in the chart forum today. The 20 20K level looks like a step too far. A failure to test it this week could well precipitate a move back to the 19,000 level over the next month or so. So for me, the trade there is to leave your stop above 20,000 and look for a move down to 19. On a risk-reward basis, it's the trade. You know, you're taking a very yeah. small amount of risk relative to the reward. So, you know, the Dow is overbought. The big question is, what's going to be the catalyst to take it higher? And I'm not sure what that catalyst will be. Earnings season starts next week. Maybe that's the catalyst to push it lower. Maybe it's the catalyst to push it higher. I certainly think the banks that we're getting next week, Bank of America, JP Morgan and Wells Fargo are going to be key. You know, will Wells Fargo be hit by the fact that the scandal of last year and the, and, and the mis-selling? Will, will they have to set aside more provisions in respect of litigation? Because obviously that was one. That Wells Fargo was one of the biggest banks in the U.S. domestic banks. Yeah, you know, could there, could there be a significant pushback on that? So, I think the next week or so will tell us a great deal as to whether or not we're going to push higher and through twenty thousand on the Dow. I still think we can probably go there in the longer term. I just think that at the moment the market looks a little bit tired, but we'll have to wait and see. Interesting that Dolly ends back around the figure now was unable to get mm -hmm. through that 4050 level. Um, so what does that mean for um, euro dollar? I think there's another good chance that we could probably test back to these 10620 level again. Um, certainly think there's potential for us to go back above 124 on dollar sterling. Though that we do have a significant resistance level on the 50 day moving average on cable, which does make me a little bit cautious on that trading between 123 2030 and 124 um, sterling has underperformed it's a very very difficult trade to make at the moment i think it's trading in a range we've had decent economic data and we've had today's mere culpa from andrew haldane from the bank of england who basically said that um, he felt that the bank of england um, got it wrong with regards to their assessment of the effect on the UK economy pre and post Brexit. Well, no kidding, but I said that on the 4th of August. 
Well, it's just a shame it's taken him five months to realise the same thing, and he gets paid a lot more money than I do. Yeah. Um, Euro sterling. Does it, by the way, I mean, da, 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 da. just been asked about the Dow again. Yeah, I would agree with that. Indicators are failing to stay above certain levels. Above 19 suggests suggest, suggest a test up, and failing to settle above suggests more downside moves. As I say, I mean, I think that just reiterates what Colin and myself have just said. I think the the, the downside risk is towards 19,000. I don't think it's probably going to go much below that, but I think it needs to shake out a, a few stale long positions before it can have another go at the 20,000 level. Uh, I think that certainly seems to be the way of it. If we look at Euro Sterling here, I'm still of the opinion that the bias remains to the downside on Euro Sterling. Um, economic data in the UK continues to come in slightly ahead of expectations. I think that's probably going to be more sterling positive. Um, certainly inflation um, expectations are higher in the UK than they are in the Euro area. And the, re and the recovery, I think, in inflationary pressures has been a direct result of a weaker currency, both sterling and Euro. The Euro is at multi-year lows against the dollar, as is the pound. And given that commodity prices are priced in dollars, and the rebound that we've seen in oil prices in the last 12 months, you've got to think that ultimately um, inflation is going to remain fairly well underpinned over the course of the next few months as the deflationary effects of the negative oil price start to roll out of the numbers. And don't need to remind you that oil prices bottomed out pretty much 12 months ago. And we can see that in this chart here. January last year, the low was $27 a barrel on Brent crude. Since then, we've gone pretty much one way. So that suggests to me that once this, this negativity in oil prices drops out of the numbers, which it will in, in January, February, March and April, we will start to get further upward pressure on CPI. Now, the big question for we're me is... We're to see that in some of the numbers already. Yeah, we are, exactly. And you're absolutely right. But we'll continue to see it. Yeah, and that, absolutely. You know, you know, and, and I think that, that, that's, that's my broader point. We're going to continue to see that. And we'll continue to see it while oil prices remain above this breakout level, which we saw in the middle of December. $53 a barrel. $53 a barrel for me is the line in the sand in terms of further you know, for, for potential downside. While we're above $53 a barrel, there's potential for further upside towards $60 a barrel, or these peaks that we saw in 2015, around about 60 65 Now, this is Brent we're talking about here. So $53 a barrel on the downside. If we go back below that, then we'll drift back below 50 While we're above 53 then I think we're going to remain fairly well underpinned. And I think this is where the proxy for dollar CAD comes in. Canada's strength... I think will only be um, a byproduct of further oil strength. Obviously, the the Canadian economy is going to be a factor into that. But I think oil prices and the Can Canadian economy are, have a rather symbiotic well, relationship. Yes, and on top of that, what we've had lately was because the U.S. dollar was so strong, CAD has been lagging behind the oil price. It's been it was depressed by the. Uh, strengthen the U.S. dollar, mm. along with a lot of other currencies, whereas oil kept on rallying. So there is some, ba there is some room de for the Canadian dollar to rally just based on the U.S. dollar pressure easing and it catching up to the gains that have been made by the oil price lately. So it's, it is a market that, uh, that's one of the more depressed ones out there with some upside. Uh, CAD, uh, gold, uh, euro, yen, those were some of the most uh, depressed markets with some room to rebound. Yeah, we've seen a decent rebound in gold prices yeah, as well, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. Sterling this week. Sorry? I'm surprised we haven't seen more of a bounce in sterling this week. So am I. I'm a little bit surprised by that, but I think there's potential for it to. St I think there's still potential for it to happen. Again, it's a similar mm -hmm. sort of story in WTI, around about $51 a barrel on the downside there, the yeah. support level. But again, you know, it's a similar sort of story to the Brent story. Um, the next target really is this series of highs through 2015, around about 60, 60 and a half, 60 dollars a barrel there seen a bit of a rebound in gold prices again that's on the back of a weaker dollar um, I think it's interesting to note that yeah. even though we saw a fairly decent um, dollar reaction to those wages numbers gold prices are still 
uh, are only down ever so slightly on the day. Um, so that would suggest to me that we, while we've seen a decent rebound, maybe there's potential for a, a little bit of further further gold strength and further dollar weakness. But for me, the 50-day moving average here, again, is going to be a key resistance level on gold prices, and that's around about... Yeah, I'm looking at gold and thing. We've had a nice move up off the bottom, but we may consolidate between that Fibonacci level there and the 50-day uh, the average just in the short, just over the next week or so while it digests some of these uh, this big move up. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the, the, the problem with gold is I think there's a downside to it, and the downside is around about 1,100. And I think while we're above that, we will remain susceptible to short squeezes. Having said that, we are now starting to look a little bit overbought, which suggests to me that we may run into a little bit of selling around about these sort of peaks that we saw here, just below 1,200. And that would suggest that potentially we could, as you say, trade between 1,150 and 1,200 for the next few days and the next few weeks. Okay, ladies and gents, does anyone have any other questions on any topics that we haven't covered? Or um, do you want us to clarify potentially anything that we've already covered? Let's have a quick look at the DAX while we're at it. Now this is an interesting chart. This is something that I've, again, this is something that I posted on the chart forums earlier today. Bit of a level at 11,670. Why is that level important? Because it was the highs in August 2015. We've broken higher this week, but we are struggling to... Since that initial push higher on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that suggests to me a lack of conviction in terms of where we go to next. Having said that, this could be a potential flag before we go higher, as long as we don't take out this series of lows through here. So let's draw that in. So 11.530 on the downside. Just being asked about silver. I'll cover that in a minute. So that looks like our DAX trading range for the time being. 11.530 on the downside, 11.600 on the top side. Pretty uninteresting over the course of the past few days. Maybe next week will give us some clarity on that. Silver. Um, well, what's happened to silver? It was there. It's because gold's moved. I don't know why that's moved. There it is. There it is. Yeah, there it is. I hope you've got deep pockets if you're trading silver. That's all I can say. It's something that I would steer well clear of. It's way too volatile for my taste. But um, in a downtrend, um, it's going to probably run into a little bit of resistance around about $17.00 or slightly below that. We've got this series of highs through here which are going to cap it. But overall it's going to be a little bit of a proxy for gold. So if you get a little bit of gold weakness you're probably going to get a little bit of silver weakness. But ultimately around about 15, 1580 decent buying interest. We did have a little bit of an overshoot in the middle of December um, but we've since recovered that. But uh, you know again is this going to be a significant proxy for what the dollar does? And at the moment, the dollar still, sh while it's showing a little bit of weakness, I think there is potential for it to move a little bit higher, but not especially when you look at the amount of resistance that we've got through $17. If you look at these lows here and there, and then these peaks here. So if we do go higher, it's going to struggle to get through $17, $17.10. Anything you want to uh, elucidate on silver, Colin, or did I pretty much cover it? No, I think you pretty much covered it. Okay, for the DAX, got some commentary on the DAX. But yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the DAX and I can't see any reason to to do anything with it unless we come back around 11, you know, 11.530. And obviously the bigger level, on that was the initial breakout level um, from earlier this year or it was around about 11.430 which was a series of lows through year and obviously the big move that we saw at the beginning of December which pushed us into positive territory for the DAX for the first time in 2016. The DAX was in negative territory for the whole of 2016 until the last few few days 
and this move here is what took us up into positive territory. No surprise when you consider how weak the euro was into the end of next year. So I think what you've got to bear in mind with respect to the DAX is if the euro rebounds and goes back through 106 or 107, the DAX is going to find it very difficult to rally significantly above where it is now because ultimately German exporters will find their ability to generate profits impacted by the fact that the dollars, the euro is rebounding. So you need to, to, to bear in mind that particular correlation. Okay, any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? We just hit the 35 minute mark. If, um, if there are no Can further... Can I a couple of things, Michael? Sure. Uh, we still have a lot of news on for the rest of the day as well. We had uh, trade balances out for uh, Canada and the United States. U.S. was in line. Canada was a little bit of a positive surprise. At uh, 10 o'clock Eastern time this morning, that's 3 p.m. in London, we have U.S. factory orders. Street expecting a decline of 2.3 percent. We have the final U.S. durable goods orders, and we also have uh, the Canada IV purchasing managers report last month was 56. Uh, later in the day, we have uh, a number of SPED speakers today and tomorrow, including some uh, talk from some of the new uh, the new voters, the, the uh, regional Fed presidents that have, uh, have rotated into being voting members this year. Kevin's talking at 11.15 Eastern Time. We've got Kaplan talking at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Mr. Tomorrow, talking we now. have Kashkari talking as well as Powell, who's one of the permanent governors. <laughs> very often. So we are going to get some Fed speak over the next couple of days as well. Yeah, obviously, everybody's keeping an eye on which way are these guys thinking about um, about rates. The uh, Kaplan, this is his first time voting with Cash Curry, so people might be quite interested to see what they have to say. Evans has historically been, from Chicago, has historically been one of the most dovish members uh, of the Fed, so uh, it'll be particularly interesting to see, does he stay in the dovish camp, and where is he at? And Mester is speaking right now, and she's just come out and said that uh, she expects three rate rises this year. It's a reasonable number, but she also goes on to say that that number is on the steep side. So it's steeper That's than the median. because she's uh, been more hawkish historically. Yeah, so she is quite hawkish, and she's actually said that her assessment is slightly steeper than the median, which suggests to me that potentially maybe there's only going to be two. So, Which um, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the, dollar's, the dollar's rebounding again now. Notice cable's around 123.30. Dolly ends back around 116.50. So, so maybe yeah, the dollar cat's back up to about 132.10 off mm. a low near 131.80. So maybe we're going to get a move higher in the dollar on the back of those comments by Mister. Thank you very much for that. So we'll have to see how the the market reacts to to three. Personally, I still think three is overstating it, but we'll, 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 we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. I do too, and what will be interesting on that, Michael, is I think we're going to see the uh, a lot of volatility in and around March, because nobody's going to, uh, nobody's, no, I mean, nobody's expecting a rate hike at uh, the uh, January, I guess it's February 1st is the decision, but uh, in that uh, late February time frame when people try to sort out, are we going to get a hike in March, which means four, or are they going to pass, which probably means two. I don't think and we're going to get one in uh, March. And I think that's why the yeah, dollar sold off personally. this week, because of the conflicted um, nature of the Fed minutes earlier this week. Yeah, so it's really I, just I personally am thinking the next rate hike comes in June. Mm, yeah, I would agree with that, which worries me, because we never agree. <laughs> Oh, well, well, even if you win in June, you have the possibility for three rate hikes because you could go in September. But I might call for the, my thinking this year is June and December. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't argue with that. Um, so there's there's that's the first thing in about three years, mate. You and I are starting to agree on stuff. It's true. <laughs> it's very true. And um, yeah, right. I just have a hard time seeing four four okay, rate hikes. Okay. Well, I think. I think unless anyone's got anything else they want to add, I'm going to wrap this up. And I'd um, okay. like to thank you all for um, attending today. We do have a Monday webinar, which is every Monday at 12.15, which is just me, where I have a look at the week ahead. Otherwise, uh, we will both, Colin and I, will see you at the same time next month for the next non-farm payrolls webinar. Thanks for listening, and um, uh, have a good weekend. Thanks. Have a great day trading, everyone.